let me perhaps make a few comments about the crisis of the euro and then end up with observations about the country that I know best, as they say in Brussels. Uh, let me remind you, first of all, that it is now almost three years since what had begun as the biggest financial crisis of the West transformed itself into a European crisis. And it was at that time that people realized what a currency without a state implies. Uh, many unthinkables have happened in terms of policy since then, uh, in terms of bailouts that were not supposed to happen, restructuring of debt that were beyond the imagination of anybody, uh, huge refinancing through the European Central Bank, new forms of close bilateral cooperation in terms of fiscal and economic policy that bring us into new and uncharted territory in the European Union, new firewalls that were supposed not to be there because people were afraid of, horror, of moral hazard, and so on and so forth. But yet, despite all this series of unthinkables in the last two and a half years, uh, we are not near the end of the crisis of the euro. And while the economic situation, especially in large parts of the European periphery, is steadily deteriorating. Now, it seems that the majority of economists and policymakers, I insist the majority, of course, not everybody, agree what a solution would more or less imply in broad terms. And now we have ended up agreeing that one of the things you require is a banking union, the other is a more advanced form of a fiscal union, and most people then add up the political union dimension to the first two. Now, you might say that the devil lies in the detail. Uh, we agree in principle, although many of us do agree in principle about the need for all those three things, yet we find it extremely difficult to implement the measures that go along. Uh, there is disagreement about the detail. There is disagreement about the sequencing. And if I may go through a list of three or four simple reasons, it seems to me, why we have such difficulty in agreeing. The first of all, first of all, there is economic divergence, which has widened inside the European Union because of the crisis. So the crisis has increased economic divergence inside the EU and the Eurozone in particular. What is happening, in fact, if you think about it, is that the periphery has been hit much harder than the center. So now we are experiencing in the last few years a reversal of the old process of European integration as a convergence machine. Now this is divergence machine. And in fact, it can actually go on for a few years to come. So if you have economic divergence, you perceive and you live the crisis very differently, depending on whether you live in Germany, Finland, Austria, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. So that makes it very difficult to agree. There are also differences in terms of economic perceptions. For example, there are differences between economists and policymakers as to where you place yourself on the spectrum, starting with stabilization on one end and growth on the other. And that's very difficult, but of course your perception is colored to a very large extent by where you sit or stand. The third point, is that the stakes are very high, which means also that the bill for solving the crisis is potentially very high. And if the bill is very high, the question that follows is who pays the bill? And how do you distribute pain? And this is, in fact, one of the most difficult things we are facing in the European Union today. When we're discussing about a European guarantee for bank deposits, we assume that those who have who are credit worthy will be under sign, underwriting a check, which hopefully will never be cashed. But if it, it is cashed, then the bill is huge. Uh, 
And then you try to explain to Germans, Finns, Austrians, and others that this is a check they should sign for the benefit of other Europeans. And that's not easy. But there are two other reasons which I think are political reasons which make an agreement on the solution to the crisis very difficult. One is that there, there is declining support for Europe-wide Europe solutions inside countries. Because there's growing populism, there's growing nationalism as a result of the crisis, and therefore popular support for potential European solutions is much weaker now than it used to be three, four, five years ago. And then if you add to that something else, and this is there's been a decline of trust between countries. So European support is declining inside countries, and trust between countries is also declining. The combination of all those things make Europe agreements very difficult indeed. Now, the only thing that is keeping our show on the road still is the realization by everybody concerned that the cost of failure may be beyond our capacity to imagine what it's going to be like. Not only the cost of failure in economic and financial terms, but also the cost of failure in political terms for European political integration as a whole. So if I were to summarize the situation perhaps we're in today, I would say that economics dictates more integration, but the political appetite is lacking. And which of the two wins in the end is still an open question. My guess is that if I were to take a bet, is that we will end up with more integration, economic, financial, and political, as the necessary price to pay for saving the euro. But this is by no means to be taken for granted. It is still an open question. Now, if we do end up with more integration and with euro, intact, then the next question that arises, or arises at least in the minds of several people, is whether we are likely to exit the crisis in one piece, or whether there will be bits and pieces that fall off. And when people talk about bits and pieces that fall off, they usually have my first my, my own country in mind. So there's been quite a bit of speculation over the last year or so as to whether Greece would remain a member of the Eurozone or not. Let me start with the good news and then move on to the bad news. Again, good and bad depends very much on what your interests and perceptions are, of course. But assuming that we all have the same interests and perceptions, let me go through the good and bad news. Now, <laughs> Greece was, as you know, the catalyst for the transformation of the international financial crisis into a European crisis in the end of 2009. Because at a time when markets began to realize that the next phase in the crisis was sovereign debt and also internal Eurozone problems, Greece appeared as the country with the worst combination of three deficits, namely a budget deficit, a current account deficit, and a deficit of credibility. Now, the deficit of credibility we got in Greece because our politicians, more than their counterparts in other countries, had proved to be extremely economical with the truth and very creative in the use of statistics. That's my <laughs> diplomatic way of presenting the Greek problem. OK, so uh, Greece became the catalyst for the crisis. Uh, the reaction of most of its European partners at the time was that it was not a problem for the rest of Europe. It was a problem for Greece to deal with, in the same way that Germany's first reaction in 2008 and 2007 was that this was a crisis that did not affect Europe. It was a problem for Americans to deal with. Then when the Greek problem erupted, then again the first reaction was that, not my problem, yours. 
so deal with it. Now, both my compatriots and the rest of Europe dithered for quite a while. And then when we finally ended up with the first bailout mechanism, so Greece opened the way for new bailouts to be decided for other countries. So in that respect, we are pioneers, if you wish. Uh, then the attitude, I mean, you read the communiques, the attitude was that Greece was unique. So it was a unique problem that required unique treatment. Nothing to do with our countries. Now, of course, soon the European Union discovered that there were other countries that had problems. So the crisis was not confined within the boundaries of the Greek state. Uh, but still many people insisted that if Greece was not unique, at least it was very different and more difficult than the others, which is perhaps true. Now, what's the good news? The good news is that Greece has delivered a much, has much in terms of fiscal consolidation. I mean, the reduction in budget deficit that Greece managed to get in two years is the biggest reduction in budget deficit that any OECD country has delivered for decades. It was more than 6% of GDP in two years, with G GDP declining fast. Now we have cut down about 8% of GDP deficit. We are about 1, 1.5% of primary deficit in our budget. So fiscal consolidation, re pretty remarkable, I think, success, if that is success. Uh, Greece has also delivered in terms of internal devaluation, which is what the IMF and the Commission was preaching. So depending on how you measure things, but there's been an internal devaluation in terms of wages and salaries of the order of about 15% in the last two and a half years, which pas mal for in a short period of time. The other good thing is that Greece now has a coalition government. You know, coalitions and compromise are almost dirty words in Greek political vocabulary. We're not used to compromise. Compromise is, in fact, a dirty word in Greek, as it is, for example, to a large extent in French, but it is not in German, and it's not, I think, in English. Compromise, if you write on a Greek headline, compromise, that means bad. You have done something wrong. Because compromise means giving in. All right? So compromise and coalition, now we have a coalition government consisting of three parties. We haven't had coalition governments for decades. So we are trying to learn this game, which is not easy to learn in a short period of time under duress. But we're making some progress. And now we have a government that seems to be also more determined than its predecessors to move ahead not only in terms of uh, fiscal measures, but also in terms of structural reforms. Structural reforms, the problem in Greece of introducing structural reforms, especially reforms that affect the role of the state, is that they will be undermining the clientele basis of Greek politics. And that's why it's difficult politically. So the people who run a clientele system, you are asking them now to dismantle it. And they don't like it, naturally. <laughs> right? so, but we are making progress on that score as well. And there is another piece of good news, which is important. And this is something that has changed in the last, I would say, three months in Europe. Until about June, July, a significant part of the German political establishment, to a much lesser extent in other countries, were convinced that an exit from, of Greece from the Eurozone was a good thing. Either because it was a lost cause, they thought, so you get rid of the weakest pupil, or because an exit from Greece would help to tell others how to behave, because punishment may follow to others. Uh, this has changed. So in the last two or three months, there are very few people who argue along those lines. So the predominant view now, again with exceptions, but the predominant view in Europe is that the exit of any country, Greece or any other, risks 
creating domino effects that will lead to the end of the show. Uh, so these are the good news. This is the good news. The bad news is that the Greek economy, more than the Spanish economy, the Italian economy, the Portuguese economy, and you tell me whether it is also the Irish economy, but I think less so, is caught in a deadly trap of austerity and recession. And it can't get out. Then Greek GDP will have declined by 20% by the end of this year, since the beginning of the crisis. And, it is, and recession is expected to continue of the order of between 4 and 6% next year. So, I mean, this is of unprecedented scale. This has not happened for 60 years anywhere. Only in Latvia they had. Yeah. I, the funny thing is, if I may open a parenthesis, several commission officials with whom I have the pleasure of exchanging views use Latvia as the example to follow. Yeah. And they say that Latvia turned over in two years. Of course, I mean, the price was 25% cut of GDP in two years, and also a loss of about 10% of their population through emigration. But it's supposed to be a successful story. And they said, you know, the Latvians took it without much protest, and I rushed to remind them that, you know, after 50 years of Soviet rule, uh, you know, people are prepared to take anything peacefully. And luckily or unluckily, Greece and Spain are not Latvia. So the bad news for me is that Greece is a country where the economy is imploding and society may be at the brink of exploding. And this is the big risk, that unless the overall strategy followed in trying to deal with the problem changes, my fear, and I would stop there, is that Greece may be leading the way to hell in Europe, followed closely by other European countries of the periphery. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest risk we are facing today in Europe. Thank you.